afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. In today's world, people and goods can travel around the globe very quickly, but the increased movement of people and materials presents a challenge. The rate and risk of invasive species is growing. In Vermont, one of the key defenses against invasive species is the Forest Pest First Detector Program. The program trains volunteers about the most wanted pests and how to be an effective first detector. A new round of training is coming up next week, and I'll have the details on that in just a moment. But first, let's hear from the program coordinator about the importance of detecting invasive species. The Forest Pest First Detector Program is an important group of citizens that are trained in the raising awareness on the threat and risk that invasive pests pose to Vermont forest resources. And we're talking about Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, and hemlock woolly adelgid. There's very limited state staff that are available to do screening and, and, um, and, and looking out for these pests. So the more people that are aware of them, the more people that we have eyes on the ground to be able to look for these pests. And then the, the sooner that we might find a potential infestation and the, minimize its impact. So the, the forest pest first detectors are really our first line and front line against, front line defense against uh, invasive pe forest pests. So who is the training for? The training is designed for anyone who really wants to take care of our forest resources here in the state. So we have people that walk their dogs out in forests to tree wardens that are appointed by each town level to train professionals and arborists, but it's really open to anyone who cares about trees and forests in Vermont. So what are the key things that volunteers are trained to do in the workshops? The volunteers are trained in learning the signs and symptoms of the three pests hemlock woolly adelgid, emerald ash borer, and Asian longhorn beetle. They're trained in what to look for on which types of trees, including tree species identification. Then they're also trained on what's happening across the country with each particular pest and what to do if they think they found a pest. How does the training that these volunteers get help their communities prepare for a possible infestation? We're hoping that people will take the information learned at the training and apply it within their communities and whatever level that that fits their, their needs in their, in their communities. So we provide a lot of resources, whether that's uh, providing a box of uh, outreach materials that people can borrow and have, host an event in their community, or whether that's helping sharing information with a community or neighbor, or even writing community preparedness plan. We offer those resources to help make a difference in those communities. Over the years, there have been some pretty important results from the First Detector training program. Tell us about some of those. Absolutely. So since 2012, we've had over 180 people trained across the entire state that have gone through this training. Um, and that has taken many different variations from people how they've used that information. One excellent rock star volunteer, uh, Sue Lovering, has created a regional invasive insect preparedness team, also called Grip It. And this is a collaborative effort across the Moyle County that incorporates a collaborative effort of, uh, towards education and outreach and planning. So these, uh, this group of folks has created an educational campaign that they've used to different news media. They've um, done a variety of ash tree inventories and they've created incredible public, um, public service announcements as well. So it's folks like that that are really making a difference on the ground and we appreciate how much that they care that they're sharing that information in their communities. And to learn more, you could visit vtinvasives.org. The next training session will be held December 6th from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. at the UVM Extension Office in Berlin. As Gwen mentioned, you can get more information by going to vtinvasives.org. Our next segment looks at the production, cultivation, and promotion of hops in Vermont. Over the past several years, UVM Extension has been engaged in key research about hops. In turn, growers in the Green Mountains and across the Northeast have come to rely on Extension's research into the challenges of growing a crop that has a lot of people hopped up. Here's Keith Silva with our story. The sun is shining and the hops are flying. You are at Homestead Hops um, in South Starksboro, Vermont. Just three this time, guy. Kathleen and Kelly Norris planted their two-acre hop yard last year. This is their first harvest. The first year is um, all about planting and um, getting the uh, root development. So you don't harvest the first year. You can get pretty good-sized plants the first year but you don't harvest them. Um, there usually isn't enough to harvest and you let all of that production go into the roots to make a better crop for your second year. 
And then the second year, if you choose to harvest, you're looking at about 50% crop. And then the third year is about 95%. And fourth year, if you don't have a full crop, you're probably make, doing something wrong. The Norrises have been longtime sugar makers. The idea to grow hops comes from wanting to work their land and the six o'clock news. We were uh, listening to the news one night and we heard a news story about how with all these new microbreweries there was going to be a shortage of hops in the country. And we kind of both looked at each other and said, well, hops, well, how do you do that? And so we started researching it and it, it's at the opposite time as sugaring. So we're able to sugar from December 1st to um, you know, May, May 1st, May 15th when we get the taps all pulled and then we can come out here in the middle of May and start training the plants and, and work them through until fall. For Norris, learning to grow hops means embracing the pioneer spirit. There's not the infrastructure in the state um, and so we've had to manufacture our own, build our own, some of our own equipment. We've had to buy a lot of equipment. And now that we're harvesting, the big struggles are um, space. Um, we're baling the product into compressed bales, and now we need to store them in freezer space. And we don't have, you know, we need a really, really big freezer space. Um, so we're going to end up having to rent commercial freezer space. Um, and we hadn't foreseen a lot of those issues. Right. Growing hops may feel to Norris like she's out in the wilderness, but she's not alone. Since 2009, University of Vermont Extension has been conducting hops trials at Porterview Research Farm in Albark. The minute we, um, we thought about doing hops, we're like, okay, well, how, how do we find out about this? And so I googled it, and of course UVM was, was right there. We would not have gone into this without their support. Um, we rely pretty heavily on what they're doing in Alberg. Um, you know, they've tested some varieties. We, we listened to what they had to say as far as what varieties to grow. Um, and their support's been tremendous. Was acceptable based on the amount of bio. The research that occurs at Board of View Farm is shared at the annual Vermont Hops Conference. UVM Extension agronomist Heather Darby leads the Northwest Crops and Soils Hops Project. Hop production continues to increase in Vermont, just like it is throughout um, the Northeast. Um, the number of growers still remains quite, quite small, um, and the acres um, on a farm remain quite small as well. And I think that, you know, likely will be the case um, into the future. You know, it, it will be... Um, a specialty market for for some growers that choose you know that path the investment to get started is quite substantial so that's a deterrent for for some new growers for sure and I think as there's more growers and more success and um, a longer history that you know it won't be looked at as such a barrier anymore so new growers will easily come on board one challenge Vermont hop growers don't have to worry too much about is finding a market for their product. Vermont alone is uh, home to over 40 craft brewers. So there's a good reason right there. And craft brewers are very interested in, um, you know, brewing locally, buying locally, and also creating um, new and interesting brews and having a way to sort of stand out amongst 40 other craft brewers in the state. You know, right now the supply is definitely not meeting the demand and local brewers are constantly reaching out trying to figure out who they can buy hops from and, um, and the, the supply is not there. So that really is not the issue here <laughs> at all. University of Vermont Extension and Four Star Farms began growing hops almost the same time. It was back in 2008. It's been a wonderful progression. Nathan Latoile grows hops on Four Star Farms just over the border from Vermont in Northfield, Massachusetts. 
He started a hop yard on three quarters of an acre. His hops production has grown to 17 acres. In 2015, we had 50% more hop production than we did in 2014, and we sold out in less than a week. The demand has been there. The demand is really what's pushed us to increase our production. We've now got those 17 acres in. We're probably going to stick, take a step back from any expansions for a little while, make sure that is all fully producing, and make sure we can sell all of those hops, but we're very optimistic. The demand has been there, and we've built that market. Demand is what makes hops such an attractive crop to potential growers. And built into that appeal is the consumer's unquenchable thirst for all things local. There is something about where hops are grown that makes them different. And every brewery, they're trying to find a way to distinguish themselves from the brewery next door. They're all making good beer, and they have to figure out a way to attract customers to them. For them to be able to buy hops that are local, to buy some very, very uh, small supply of a particular variety from a nearby recognizable farm, that's going to draw the customers in to have the beer when they put that farm's name on it, when they put the location of where that farm is. The success of Four Star Farms and other growers goes back to the research being conducted at UVM. There's a lot of research that's been done over the years in other parts of the world, and to some extent that's transferable to the Northeast. Some of the stuff on disease, some of the stuff on the weather, some of the cultural practices you can do to deal with pests. It applies to some extent to what we're doing here in the Northeast, but having people who can understand that research a lot better than us, who can then take that and translate it to what's going on here in the Northeast, and maybe even do some of those trials again and adapt them and get results based on what's happening here in the Northeast. That's where that, that research has been really crucial. We're in Massachusetts, we're not in Vermont, but UVM has had an incredible presence on our farm, and I think it benefits them as well. By comparing what's happening in Alberg to what's happening in Northfield, Massachusetts, gives a really good perspective of what's happening across Vermont and what can be done across Vermont to help the hops industry and across New England. Research in Vermont is, is excellent and compares just as well to the research in the Pacific Northwest. Sarah Del Moro is an agronomist for Haas, a company based in Yakima, Washington, that's a leading supplier and researcher of hops in the U.S. Del Moro's advice for growers, always be the best. Quality. Quality is most important and consistency sometimes. Um, we have brewers that do have an interest in the Cascade hop that's from Oregon instead of the Cascade hop that's from Washington because of the different characteristics. But when they decide on still one of those locales, they want to be able to continue to get that hop for their recipes and have a quality hop. Back at Homestead Hops in South Starksboro, Kathleen Norris sees this new agricultural business as a means to continue a farming legacy. This um, farm here belonged to my husband's um, grandparents. Um, we were actually figuring out the other day, we, we can track at least five generations um, on his um, grandmother's side. And we felt like it was important to do something with the land. And it's kind of neat to do something different that not everybody's doing. Um, we probably won't get rich doing it, but um, we, we love being here. Kathleen knows if more growers, to put it one way, hop to it, then this industry will grow and thrive. Do your homework, um, work with the UVM team, um, and really listen to what they have to say. And I think hops have a future in Vermont. Um, you have to want to work hard. And you want to have to love the land. Uh, hopefully the equipment will come, come a long way for, for future growers. Um, and those of us who have started it, if we can be of any help, um, you know, along with UVM, then, you know, please ask. When it comes to hops, if all you have to do is ask, then growers like Kathleen Norris and UVM Extension are happy, or is it hoppy, to tell their story. In South Starksboro, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. For more information about growing hops in Vermont, check the website uvm.edu slash extension slash crop soil and then click on the link for hops. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.